All right, welcome back. We are in Genesis chapter 16 in this episode. Took a couple weeks break to talk about Mother's Day and to talk about six lessons from my dad's 60th birthday. If you haven't listened to those, I invite you to go back and do that. But today we're going to get back into the book of Genesis. And Genesis chapter 16, after Abraham has been trusting God, Genesis chapter 16 is a moment when Abram and Sarai's faith in God, their trust in God, begins to waver once more. As we open up in Genesis 16, verse 1 and 2, we read about Abram listening to Sarai. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Their impatience in God's promise and their acting upon their own uncertainty as to how God was going to keep his promise, it shows a lack of trust here. Sarai's thinking seems to be, you know, maybe... Maybe I'm not the one who's going to have Abram's child. Maybe, maybe that child will be born through my maid. So they are so desperate to have children that now they're beginning to think, well, maybe, maybe this, maybe that. And once again, though, we see that Egypt enters the picture once again. Hagar is an Egyptian maidservant. When... Uh, when Abram's trust in God had wavered before, Egypt was where he went. That was Genesis 12, verse 10 through 20. Now, their trust in God's promise is wavering yet again, and once again, Egypt comes into the picture. So that's an important little side note to, to notice here. Something else that stands out is the multiple wives or the multiple women in a man's life. Adam's only wife appears to have been Eve, just as God intended it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 through verse 24, also Matthew 19, verse 1 through 9. You get to Genesis 4, 19, and we read of Lamech, Cain's descendant. He is the first one we read of who took multiple wives. Once again, that's Genesis 4, 19. A descendant of Cain, remember what Cain did. The taking of many wives in Genesis 6, verse 1 through 3, is connected to God promising to destroy the earth by a flood. And so the the point is this about the multiple wives. So far in Genesis, nothing good has come from men taking multiple wives. Every time that has come up, bad things tend to follow. Lamech, Cain's descendant, we read about in Genesis 4, 19, not a good guy. Uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 3, the taking of many wives is part of the connection to God promising to destroy the earth by the flood. So that should there, there should be, a, you might say there should be red flags going up here. Alarm bells should be going off. This is not a good decision. Nothing good so far in this book has come from this kind of a situation. And as we read on in Genesis, what you're going to see is problems continue to arise over this same situation. So that's just something to take note of. An alarm bell should be going off as far as what do you think is going to happen next? The phrase, when the text said the phrase, Abram heeded the voice of Sarai, it's a, that is also a troubling one because we have seen it before in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis 3.17, part of the reason that Adam was cursed was because the text says he heeded the voice of his wife Eve. Now, some translations will, here in Genesis 16, will put listened, and that's that's a rather unfortunate translation because it misses the point of the word. Uh, listening to your wife is not a bad thing. And it misses the point of what this word here, heeded, what it means. The word here for heeded, it means to hear carefully and, included within it, and obey. 
In Genesis 3, we're going to go back and read this one. In Genesis 3, verse 16, part of Eve's curse for her sin was that she would have the desire to rule over her husband. But God placed the man as the head of the marriage relationship. Notice Genesis 3, 16. To the woman, God says to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Now notice the last part of this verse. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. I think what God is saying is part of the the curse of sin, not only was it going to be all this pain and childbearing, but it's going to be you're going to have this deep desire to be the one who rules over your husband, but that's not going to be my order of things. God has designed the institution of marriage, and he has also designed the way the marriage relationship is supposed to work. And To me, the best picture that you see of that is Ephesians 5, verse 22 through 33, where the husband is likened to Christ and the wife to the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Wives, respect and submit to your husbands as the church then, how the church sees Christ and respects Christ. Treat your husband that way. That's how the marriage relationship is supposed to work. Husbands need to be very mindful of something that Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 7. I'm going to read that now. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, dwell with your wife, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. I think what Peter is getting at here is he's not saying weaker vessel as in physically weaker because the context here doesn't really make sense as far as that goes. I think what Peter is saying in context is husbands live with your wife, honoring her, understanding the challenges of her role. Knowing that her role does not make her any less an heir of God than you. The weaker vessel, no... Know the difficult thing that she's been asked to do because the command to wives in 1 Peter 3, verse 1 through 6, it has to do with them being submissive to their own husbands. Husbands, live with them, honoring them, lifting them up, knowing the challenging role that they have, knowing what a difficult thing it is that God has asked for them. Don't uh, don't hold that over their head, but... Live with them with understanding. Honor, give honor to them. So don't, don't lord it over them. Don't treat them like they are less than you. Don't treat them that way because you are heirs. You are both heirs together of the grace of life. And the warning at the end of the verse is that your prayers may not be hindered. And so we're reminded of that. Abram wasn't perfect in the marriage relationship either. In Genesis 12, verse 10 through 13, he's supposed to be willing to die for his wife, but he's more afraid there when they go down to Egypt of what will happen to him than of what will happen to her. And so knowing all of that background, if we have never, if we, if we've never read the Bible, whether you have or whether you haven't, if we haven't ever read the Bible past Genesis 16, verse 2, how would you expect things to turn out from this decision by Abram and Sarah? Not too good, right? <laughs> There's a lot of, there are several red flags. There are, should be alarm bells, warning sirens going off at this point in your mind because there are several things that have happened in these two verses that are like, oh, this is, this is not good. We've seen some of these things before and nothing good came out of it. And so, Let's read on in Genesis 16, verse 3 through 6, and we are not surprised to find out that Abram and Sarai's plan goes horribly wrong. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, 
my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from, Hagar fled from Sarai's presence. So, not surprising, based on the track record in Genesis, Nothing good comes from departing from God's plan for marriage. Once Hagar is pregnant, Hagar looks with contempt upon Sarai. In these ancient cultures, uh, when, when multiple wives tended to be sometimes the common thing, the wife with the heir was viewed as the the primary wife. In the, so in the eyes of society at this time, and in Hagar's own eyes, she has arisen from a servant to the primary wife of a wealthy man. That's what many in society would have seen. That's, in Hagar's mind, that's what had happened. Hagar's opinion of Sarai was that she had been demoted while Hagar had arisen to the place of prominence. Uh, later on in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, a similar situation happens later with Hannah, Samuel's mother. So what Hagar is thinking is not out of the norm for this time period and for uh, situations where a man had multiple wives. She is the one with the child. She is the one with the heir. Now she is often viewed by many as the primary wife. And this, she looks down. She looks with contempt upon Sarai. And Sarai blames Abram for Hagar's attitude, not for Hagar's attitude, not the pregnancy. Sarai seems convinced that Abram had encouraged this attitude in Hagar in some way. And as far as the text goes, we have no reason to doubt her. So, Whether intentional or not, this is yet another shortcoming by Abram in this situation. It seems whether he meant to or not, the text seems to indicate that Sarai is not just making something up. So Abram, once again, there's a shortcoming on Abram's part in this situation. And Abram replies to Sarai by simply saying, look, She's still your maid. Treat her how you want. And once again, that goes very poorly. Sarai deals very harshly. She mistreats Hagar. And so to recap this whole situation, this whole situation that has gone horribly wrong, Abram obeys his wife and takes Hagar as another wife. She does get pregnant, but when she does, when Hagar gets pregnant, She looks down upon Sarai and views herself as the prominent wife. Abram apparently reinforced this attitude in Hagar in some way. At least Sarai was convinced of that. And when Sarai confronts Abram about it, Abram reminds Sarai that Hagar is still her maid. And Sarai mistreats Hagar. So it's it's a situation where... You can look at every person in this situation, and there is blame to go around, as it usually is in a lot of situations when things go poorly. It's not usually one person's fault, but usually whoever's involved in the situation, there's often blame, plenty of blame to go around, and that's what you find here. And so then Hagar, we read, uh, flees, runs away. After Sarai deals harshly with her, after Sarai mistreats her. But the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar. Genesis 16, verse 7 through 14 say, Now the angel of the Lord found her, found Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur, S H U R. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress 
and submit yourself under her hand. Now, we'll pick up with the next few verses here in just a second. The way to sure is on the route that the children of Israel traveled when they left Egypt. Uh, so Exodus 15 verse 22 points this out. So this very spot that Hagar is at, later on the children of Israel are reading or hearing the book of Genesis as they are leaving Egypt, and they hear the book of Exodus, and they think, oh, we just passed that. So this is basically the point being is Hagar, an Egyptian, is going back to Egypt. That's the what's being told to us. This is, this is the way down to Egypt. She's running away. Where is she going? Well, she's on the way to Egypt. Whatever was included in Sarai mistreating her, and the text is not specific, whatever it was, it was bad enough for Hagar to pack up and run away, uh, to pack up and try to leave, go back to Egypt. Whatever situation she was in in Egypt, uh, she was probably perhaps some sort of servant in Egypt as well. She figures that will be better than what I'm currently facing. But God confronts her and tells her to return and submit herself to Sarai. Sometimes in the Old Testament, and you'll notice uh, I'm using the New King James Version and the word angel is capitalized. Sometimes in the Old Testament when the angel of the Lord is mentioned, sometimes it is a reference to God himself. The word angel means messenger. Uh, so so it, this may very well be not an angel in what you and I think of as an angel, but it's this is the messenger of the Lord. This is God himself appearing to her. So God confronts her and tells her to return and submit herself to Sarai. Hagar's lack of humility had contributed to the problems that she was having, and God tells her to humble herself. She can't, of course, control how she is treated, but God does tell her to control what she can control, which is her own attitude, her, her pride. And so then, though, God says to her, continuing back to our text, then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So God also gives her a promise. She would have many descendants through her son that she must name Ishmael. Her son's name was a testimony to the fact that the Lord heard her affliction. God saw how she was treated, and he heard her. This, by the way, would remind the children of Israel of their time in bondage. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25, and Exodus 3, verse 7, it says, that God saw and he heard their affliction at the hands of the Egyptians. And so we have this interesting circle. An Egyptian suffered at the hands of the father and mother of the Israelites, Abram and Sarah, and later the Israelites would suffer at the hands of the Egyptians. Just an ironic Interesting circle here. Before the children of Israel were ever mistreated as slaves by the Egyptians, you have their father and mother, Abraham and Sarah, mistreating an Egyptian. It's also extremely interesting, we'll get into this later in Genesis, that Joseph's brothers in Genesis 37 sell him to the Midianites, who were descendants of Ishmael. So there are some interesting connections here as you go throughout the book of Genesis and as you get into the book of Exodus to this situation we just read about. Now God tells her that her son would be a wild man. Uh, the the Net Bible translator notes said that Ishmael would be a would be free roaming and strong. He would enjoy the freedom his mother sought. 
uh, uh, he would also, and that's in quote, he would live on the edge of society. He would kick off the restraints of social norms. He would be free. So God's promise to Hagar offers her son what she is de- desperately seeking in this moment, freedom. He tells her, if you will return and submit a while longer, I will give your son what you are looking for, freedom. And so then, Hagar, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahor Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So the way that she thinks of the Lord is, he is the God who sees even me. An Egyptian maidservant, he is the God who even sees me. She also, she now knows. God is not just the God of Abram and Sarai but he is the God of Hagar, too. And that is a very powerful lesson that we are going to see throughout the Scripture. God is not just the God of a certain special, you know, ethnic group of people or a group of people who live in a certain region, but he is the God of all people. And then at the end of the book, or the chapter of Genesis 16, we read about Ishmael being born. This is Genesis 16, 15 through 16. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So Hagar does what God tells her. She bears a son, and Abram calls him Ishmael. Hagar must have told Abram what happened when she ran away and why she returned. Because Abram calls the son's name exactly what God told Hagar to name him. So Hagar, when she comes back, Abram probably wants to know what happened. Why'd you run away? And why did you come back? And Hagar tells him. And Abram says, all right, well. And Abram, to his credit, believes her and names the child exactly what God said to name the child. Now, something interesting about Hagar and Ishmael Paul uses, as we look forward to the New Testament, Paul used Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac as a a symbolic illustration of the two covenants, the old and the new covenant. In the book of Galatians, in, excuse me, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 through verse 31, what was going on in that book was that some of the Christians in the region of Galatia had turned to a different gospel, a perverted gospel, Galatians 1, verse 6 through 7. And it seems that this gospel would have included things like what's mentioned in Acts 15, 1, where Jewish teachers attempt to convert, they attempted to convert people to Judaism before they could obey the gospel. You know, if you want to be saved, you must be circumcised, is what they were teaching in Acts 15, verse 1. And Paul's point in using Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac in Galatians 4, he points out that as Christians, we are not children of the flesh, and he likens that to Ishmael and Hagar, but of the promise. We are children of promise, which he likens to Sarah and Isaac. Those who are of faith, he says in Galatians 3, verse 7 through 9, are sons of Abraham, and that is through Isaac, who represents the new covenant. So, There's a very interesting connection to Isaac and Ishmael, to Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac and Sarah in the book of Galatians. Now, some practical application from Genesis 16, and then we'll wrap this up. As as Christians, we are to follow the example of Jesus Christ and submit ourselves to others, even if we have to suffer. Peter talks about this in a very broad section in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, all the way through chapter 3, verse 17. We are to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he suffered, how he was mistreated, how he was reviled, and we are to do what is right, even if we suffer. So that's one 
point of application from this. But also something else that we mentioned is that God is the God of all people, not just the descendants, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he is the God of all people. And this also shows that God has always cared about all people, people from different nations, people from different backgrounds. He has always cared deeply about them. We see that in his interaction with Hagar here in Genesis chapter 16. So Genesis chapter 16, a situation that did not go well, and I guess you can say as it kind of concluded, a situation kind of wraps up, it's like, whew, okay, that's behind us, but What we're going to see as we go forward in this book is that this decision is going to continue to give problems to Abraham and to his descendants, and we'll see more about that as we go forward in the book of Genesis. But I appreciate you studying along with me in Genesis chapter 16 today. Lord willing, next time we will be in Genesis chapter 17, where Abram is going to return to a a trust in God's promises again. God is going to to reaffirm the covenant that he has made with Abram. And we're going to see, in fact, their names change to probably what you most commonly call them, to Abraham and Sarah in Genesis uh, Genesis 17. But I look forward to studying with you then, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.